الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back to the uh, Tafsir, weekly Tafsir. We left off last session, verse number, we completed verse number uh, 32. Today we'll be covering verse number 33. Verse number 33. From Qala Ya Adamu, Anbi'hum bi asma'ihim. Falamma anbi'hum bi asma'ihim, Qala Alam Akul. Alam akul lakum inni a'lamu ghayba as-samawati wal-ard. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he said, O Adam, inform them of their names. Then when he, Adam alayhi salam, informed them of their names, he said, meaning Allah said, didn't I tell you that I am the only one who knows for sure the unseen of the skies of the heavens and the earth, and what you are exposing, revealing, and that which you have been hiding. Now let's go back a little bit to the scene that we left before Ramadan. Where were we in terms of the story of Adam alayhi salam? So as we mentioned in the previous ayahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing this scene with Adam alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he informs the angels that I am going to make on the earth a khalifa, I'm going to place on the earth a khalifa. He's going to create human beings. The angels ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are you going to place therein someone who will cause corruption, so mischief on earth and spill blood. This was the question that the angels asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and the dialogue continued that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that I know that which you do not know. And then it continues that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names of everything or the names, all of the names. And we mentioned that there's different opinions about what those names were. Then he presented those things, those objects or those things that were named to the angels and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the angels that inform me of these names if you are truthful. Meaning, if you are truthful about Adam alayhi salam, that he will cause mischief and things like that, or your view of Adam alayhi salam, that he's not probably fit to be Khalifa on the earth. They had this fear, the angels feared that this new creation would disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would create confusion, corruption on the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you are truthful in what you claim, then I'm going to show you something. First of all, inform me of the names of these things. Then they obviously responded that subhanaka, la ilma lana illa ma allamtana. Glory be to you. We have no knowledge except that which you have taught us. Meaning, you haven't taught us the names of these things, we have no knowledge of it. Indeed, you are Al Alim, the all knowing and the all wise, Al Hakim. So the angels immediately acknowledge they have no knowledge of the names of these things. They acknowledge their deficiency in knowledge and they ascribe perfect, all encompassing knowledge and wisdom to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O Adam, this is where we'll start from today, O Adam, inform them of the names of these things. Those things, it's not mentioned clearly in the Quran. What are those things? What are those objects or what are these items that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about? It's not mentioned clearly. We'll come to some opinions. But anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking Adam, now inform them. Name these things, inform the angels, what are, what, what are, what are the names of these objects of the, or these things. So here, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing this in front of the angels, there's a couple of things happening here. One is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 
raising the rank of Adam alayhi salam. He's making clear the rank, the position, the honor of Adam alayhi salam. Because he's about to reveal the fact that Adam alayhi salam knows some things which the angels don't know, thereby raising the rank of Adam alayhi salam. Number two, he's also placing Adam alayhi salam as a teacher of the angels. Meaning he's giving Adam alayhi salam a position of teaching. And thirdly, he's making the angels in the position of students. So teacher and students, Adam alayhi salam, he will teach them the names of these things. The angels become his students. And later on in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa although will come to the sequence in another ayah, which comes next in the Quran, but it doesn't mean the events actually took place in that sequence. But anyway, in another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes, as we all know, the angels bow down to Adam alayhi salam or prostrate due to Adam alayhi salam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll come to the discussion of that ayah. But here four things are happening to make clear the position of Adam alayhi salam over the angels. So this is like when a teacher in a classroom, he has the best student, the brightest student, and he asks a question to the class and nobody can answer. But the teacher knows that top student, he has the answer or she has the answer. And he says, okay, so-and-so, Abdullah or Amina, tell them the answer. Why? Because it, it displays this person knows more than the others. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing something similar. He's explaining and exposing the fact that Adam alayhi salam is of a higher rank with regards to this compared to the angels. And also teaching the angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a purpose in every action that he does. There is a wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is all encompassing. He knows things which the angels do not know. The secret behind the creation of Adam alayhi salam. In terms of what was being named, there are different opinions. What, what, are, the, what are these names that were taught to Adam alayhi salam? Two broad categories. One is, some of them said that it's the names of everything. Trees, mountains, everything on this earth and heaven, all the objects, Adam alayhi salam was told the names of everything. This is one opinion. One of the things that backs this opinion up is a hadith in Bukhari. It's a long hadith, but a part of it, Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam says, فَيَأْتُونَ آدَمَ فَيَقُولُونَ أَنْتَ أَبُ النَّاسِ خَلَقَكَ اللَّهِ بِيَدِهِ وَأَسْجَدَ لَكَ مَلَائِكَتَهُ وَعَلَّمَكَ أَسْمَاءَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam said in a long hadith, a part of it, he said, then they will come to Adam alayhi salam. This is describing the scene of, on the Day of Judgment. And the people will say, you are Abu Nas, you are the father of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you with his hands. And he made the angels prostrate to you, bow down to you. And he taught you the names, وَعَلَّمَكَ أَسْمَاءَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ he taught you the names of everything. So this is one evidence from the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names of every single thing. There, there is a debate in language. What comes first? The nouns or the verbs? The names of things or verbs? What came first? So if we go by this, there's an indication that the names came first. People learn, and this is how children learn. The first thing they learn are names, you know, uh, Abu and Ammi, and th these are nouns they learn when they first begin language. And it's also linguist, linguists are almost unanimous that children have an amazing gift of learning language. It's inherent, it's natural. All children are hardwired to pick up language very quickly. And it's not that they copy everything, no. They, they learn by hearing some words, but they have the ability 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the ability to take those words and create new sentences with those words. They will create a new sentence which their father or mother has never said, simply from the words they pick up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them this, all human beings, this inherent nature to learn and acquire language and to articulate. And this is also connected to uh, the story of Adam alayhi salam. The first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he taught Adam alayhi salam are the names of everything. And this is really a gift, a ni'mah. We don't, we don't think about it. This is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a big ni'mah that he has given us the tawfiq, the ability, the competency, the faculties to learn language, to speak, to articulate, to, to describe, to, to, to say what we need, to, to uh, dream and give vision to people, to communicate our inner feelings between each other. This is what differentiates human beings from the rest of creation. So this is an immense gift and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, عَلَّمَهُ bayan that he taught them bayan. Bayan is clear speech, speech that is very clear. It hits the mark, it's very clear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given human beings to articulate their feelings, their desires, their needs, their wants. So this is an immense gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another opinion is what Adam alayhi salam was taught here was the names of his progeny, the names of all the children that will come after him, the names of the righteous children that would come after him, including prophets and the righteous and the martyrs and the believers who would come after him. Why would he teach them these names? They said because the angels said, this Khalifa you're creating will sow corruption on the earth and will spill blood. But by showing the angels, the names of these righteous people from amongst the children of Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is proving or showing that you're incorrect in your judgment to the angels. That look, there will be righteous people from Adam alayhi salam. There will be believers, there will be prophets, there will be scholars, there will be people who do good works and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the secret behind creating Adam alayhi salam. So this is another opinion which is also there. But all in all, whatever he was taught, this was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what elevated Adam alayhi salam above the angels. Now there's a whole debate about who is higher. Is it angels are higher or human beings are higher in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's two, again, there's different opinions, but two main opinions. It's not important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't tell us clearly in the Quran the answer to this question. There's indications, there's verses, there's hadith. But a, a good summary is that those human beings like the prophets and righteous human beings, those who believe and follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, all his prophets, they, when they are in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are higher than the angels. And those human beings who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are rebellious, who do not follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they of course are lower than the angels. So this is how some scholars have uh, merged the two opinions of, some opinions said the angels are higher than human beings and others said no, Human beings are higher than angels. But other scholars merged and made sense of both opinions together. Sorry, yeah. Sure. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that قَالَ يَا أَدَمُ أَنْبِئْهُمْ بِأَسْمَائِهِمْ O Adam, inform them of the names, their names. فَلَمَّا أَنْبَئَهُمْ بِأَسْمَائِهِمْ قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ غَيْبَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَأَعْلَمُ مَا تُبْدُونَ وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْتُمُونَ Here, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. He says, when Adam alayhi salam informed them of their names, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
didn't I tell you? He's speaking to the angels. Didn't I tell you that I know the ghayb, the unseen of the heavens and the earth? And I know that which you expose or reveal, that which you say openly, and that which you hide. I know both. I know the unseen of the heavens and the earth, and I know that which you say openly, and I know that which you hide in yourselves. So this is, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching the angels, teaching us, teaching human beings, the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, that it encompasses everything. He knows the unseen of the heavens and the earth. What's the unseen of the heavens and the earth? It is every knowledge that has human beings have no access to. There are so many things that human beings, forget the heavens, just on the earth, there, is so many, there are so many things that we do not have access to knowing. We don't even know what will happen the next half an hour. Can anybody here predict accurately what will happen in the next half an hour? That's ghaib, that's unseen. What will happen tomorrow? What is happening now in another country? We don't know. There's so much information and knowledge that human beings simply cannot know. This is the ghaib, this is the unseen. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. And then he's making clear, he knows that which you speak about and that which you hide inside you. Whatever is inside you, he knows both aspects. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say uh, whatever you are hiding? Did, were the angels hiding anything in this uh, conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to the angels, that I know what you say, but I also know what you are hiding. Were the angels hiding anything? There's two opinions. One is that the angels, the feeling they had about Adam alayhi salam, he's not fit for being Khalifa on the earth. That's one opinion. The other opinion is that amongst the angels was Iblis. Was Iblis present? He was present amongst the angels. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he knows what you say openly, meaning what the angel said about Adam alayhi salam, but he also knows what you are hiding, meaning he knows what Iblis is hiding in his heart. He's hiding, he's amongst the angels, but he's not saying it, his pride, his arrogance, the fact that he doesn't want to bow down to Adam alayhi salam, the fact that he will rebel, the fact that he's there for pride, not sincerely obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this clear that he knows what is, what, whatever you're hiding, meaning he knows what Iblis is hiding. And this is part of the secret of creating Adam alayhi salam and, and putting the angels to this test. So in this short verse or ayah, there are so many lessons. Number one, the first lesson is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always acts with full and perfect knowledge and wisdom. Because why? He knows everything. Even though the angels, they were fearful, they didn't understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating Adam alayhi salam. They didn't realize what the purpose was. They didn't realize the wisdom. Right? But as soon as they realized their shortcoming, as soon as they realized that subhanallah, we only know that which you taught us. They submit, they acknowledge, they admit. And this is a lesson for us. Whatever happens in our lives, whatever happens, whatever trials and tribulations you may be going through, you may go through a big loss financially, you may go through a big test, you, something may happen in the community, you may feel you're oppressed or discriminated against or something happened to you that you, was, you weren't expecting, some kind of financial loss, or you lost a member of your family. All of these trials and tribulations, people often react angrily, often think, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? Why are we being oppressed? Why did this happen to me? But this is the lesson to learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His knowledge is perfect. It's all encompassing. Leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what he's doing. There's a wisdom behind every action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. 
There's a wisdom behind every single thing that happens in your lives. Leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who has perfect, all-encompassing knowledge of everything. If that's the case, shouldn't we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of our affairs? No matter where we find ourselves, no matter which situation we find ourselves, we should trust completely, submit completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, Ya Allah, you know what is best for me. You know why you did this. You know why this happened to me. You know why the community is being attacked here. There is a wisdom. There is a purpose. Our sole responsibility is to respond with submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I submit to the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I then look to see what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command me to do in this situation. And I have to act accordingly. Not according to my whims and desires. Not according to my emotion. Not according to my anger. Not according to my sense of loss or, or sense of uh, being wronged. I have to act according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me to act in this particular situation. Why? Because he is Alim Al-Hakim. He is all-knowing and he is wise. And whenever two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned together, it's not just that these two separate attributes, he has these both. It's not just that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing, Al-Alim. And it's not just that he is all-wise, Al-Hakim. But he's, there's a third attribute here. When you combine the two, someone may be knowledgeable, but he has no wisdom. Someone might know a lot of things, but he's really stupid when it comes to making a wise decision. He does things which, which uh, people will see as stupidity. Someone could be wise, but he, has not, he doesn't have much knowledge. Someone could be wise, a simple person, but he could have wisdom, but he doesn't have much knowledge. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has both, but in its combination, it becomes a third attribute. He's Al-Alim, Al-Hakim, both combined together. So in all of our affairs, we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he knows more than everybody else and he's wise, he's the, one, he's the wisest above all his creation. The other second lesson in this short ayah is the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preferring somebody over you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preferred Adam alayhi salam in this scene over the angels. How do we react when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prefers somebody over us? How should we react when we see somebody has more wealth than me? Somebody has more talent than me? Somebody is more knowledgeable than me? Somebody has more gifts, natural gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than me? Somebody's life is better than my life. How, how do we react? How should we react? We should react in the same way that the angels have reacted. This is another lesson from this scenery, if you like, from this scene, from this part of the story. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his wisdom, in his perfect knowledge, chooses other people above us, we submit to that choice. We submit to that decision. We say, Ya Allah, you are perfect in knowledge. You have given the right thing to the right person. You should never feel that, oh, subhanAllah, this person is such an idiot. How did he make so much money? You, you hear this so many times. This person doesn't know how to sign his name. He owns 20 businesses. SubhanAllah, I've, I've got a degree. I've done this, I've done that. I can't, I'm not as successful. Or somebody looks at somebody with some kind of talent or ability. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me that ability, that skill, that knowledge, that voice, that, the way that person looks, etc., etc.? There's so many layers of preference that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to other people. And we see this every day. How do we react? We should react like the angels reacted. We submit to the decision, the choice, the preference of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he says in the Quran that he has preferred some of you over others. Why? To test your patience. Will you then be patient? The third lesson from this ayah from this interaction between the angels, Adam alayhi salam, 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the virtue of knowledge. If you look at these ayahs, it all revolves around knowledge. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels they do not know what Allah knows. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches Adam some knowledge. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distinguishes between the angels and Adam alayhi salam based on what? Based on knowledge. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his own knowledge, perfect knowledge, that it's all encompassing. He knows everything. So most of these verses, there is a common thread through these verses. It's about knowledge. First of all, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is perfect. It encompasses everything. Secondly, he has distinguished, honored human beings with one specific characteristic, and that is knowledge, ilm. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to display the superiority of Adam alayhi salam over the angels, he could have done so with other characteristics, with other features of Adam alayhi salam. But he chose what? Knowledge. He chose knowledge. So this is the virtue of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقُرْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to make this dua. O oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. Rabbi zidni ilma. They said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has not been commanded to ask for increase in anything else except for knowledge. Subhanallah. In the Quran, there's no other dua to be increased in anything except for knowledge. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that are those who know equal to those who do not know. Of course, they're not equal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Allah will exalt and raise in degree those of you who believe and those who have been given knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَى اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Indeed, they who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from amongst his slaves are the ulama. Here, ulama is not the uh, professional scholars. That's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here in the way that we know what an alim is. No. Ulama here means those who have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who have knowledge of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who have knowledge of the sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody with the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who act by it, they are the ones who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, Muawiyah radiallahu an, he said the messenger of Allah said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes good for somebody, he bestows upon him understanding of the deen, yufaqihu fi deen. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for somebody, what does he do? He gives them fiqh of deen. Not, again, it's not the fiqh we know, the fiqh of the books. Here it simply means a deep understanding of the deen. He gives them deep understanding of the deen. But how can you gain this deep understanding? The Prophet said, Al-ilmu bit ta'allum. You gain it through learning, through studying, through effort. The Prophet also said, according to Abu Huraira radiallahu an, that the world with all that is in it, that it contains, is cursed, except for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the religious scholars, the alim and the muta'allim, the alim and the seeker of knowledge. Everything else is cursed in this world, reported by Tirmidhi, everything else is cursed in this world, except for those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with something that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teachers of knowledge and the seekers of knowledge. Three things. And those who are engaged in seeking or teaching knowledge, they're making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anyway. So this, these are some of the virtues of knowledge. Also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Indeed the angels lower their wings, pleased for the student of knowledge. Ridan, here the word rida, you know, they're pleased with the strip, meaning what? They lower their wings in humility, in honor, 
in submission to the rank of the student of knowledge. And Imam Qurtubi, he says that this is because the angels were taught to do this from the very beginning with Adam alayhi salam when he was taught those names. They were told to prostrate even before he was taught those names. When Adam alayhi salam was created, the angels were taught to bow down to Adam alayhi salam because of his capability of knowledge and acting by that knowledge in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore on this earth, when a seeker of knowledge, a student, walks to the masjid, walks to the class, walks somewhere to seek knowledge from his teacher or from a class, the angels lower their wings, pleased in humility for the seeker of knowledge. And Imam Qurtubi says, this is for the student of knowledge, the seeker of knowledge. Imagine those righteous, pious scholars of knowledge. How would the angels uh, interact with them? So, in summary, the three lessons that we have um, from this one verse is the important lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always acts with full knowledge, with full wisdom, with, with perfection in his knowledge. There's a purpose and wisdom for everything he does. Secondly, if we're tested, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant some people greater gifts above us. He will choose others above us. And this is a test. Just like he chose Adam alayhi salam to teach him and to make him khalifa on the earth above the angels, he will, he will select people from amongst human beings. No two people are going to be alike. Somebody will have greater wealth. Somebody will have greater skill. Somebody will have a, a greater strength or ability or talent or whatever it is. How do we react? How do we deal with that? We deal with it in the way that the angels dealt with it. They, uh, they submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't become jealous. They, uh, they acknowledge that there must be a wisdom why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that person that thing. And also to acknowledge and recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given me many, many gifts. Because there's somebody lower than you looking at you thinking you're higher than him in, in many, many things. So it's always about relativity. You look down to somebody to feel good because you've got more than him. So in all blessings, you can always compare with someone either more than you or less than you. So don't forget the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Always remember that. And the third thing is the virtue of knowledge. The importance of knowledge. This is what distinguishes human beings. This is what distinguishes Adam alayhi salam above the rest of creation. Now, we have several problems when it comes to knowledge. One or two things very quickly. One is generally our community, the level of knowledge, Islamic literacy is very low. And, and the Mufassirun, they said, how can you choose to be ignorant when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated and honored and, and dignified your father in the heavens with knowledge above everything else? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put this feature of knowledge so close to Adam alayhi salam, so close to his characteristic, his nature, how can you now choose to be ignorant? This goes against the very nature of your creation. It goes against the very nature of the purpose of your creation. So this is something to understand that as a community, we need to raise our level of Islamic literacy. We need to raise the level of knowledge amongst our community. Um, you go on to social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, it's full of um, arguments and debates, um, many, many ignorant comments from people who don't know, from people who know a little bit, from, from young uh, people who think they know they've mastered Islam. There's confusion, there's arguments, there's takfir, making someone out of Islam. There's misguidance. There's all these problems. Why? Because of the level of literacy. Islamic literacy is very low amongst us. You know, when we speak about literacy, we say in the third world, literacy levels are low. What does that mean? It means the number of people who can read and write is very low. Maybe only 10% or 20% of the people can read or write. So when we say Islamic literacy is low, we mean it in the same way. The number of people who can access the books of Islam, 
And it doesn't have to be in Arabic. You can gain a proficient level of Islamic literacy in English or any language. But the number of people who can access the books, who understand the basics of Islam, the essentials of Islam, is a very low percentage in our communities. And it's down to us to take that challenge on, to learn and to teach others. The other problem is about learning knowledge through um, different lenses or different groups or different frameworks. What do I mean by this? One of the big crises and problems that I see amongst those who are practicing and trying to learn is instead of, where, where does knowledge come from? Where does our knowledge come from? The main source we have is the Quran. This is the only source. The Sunnah is an extension of this source. The Quran and Sunnah. Quran is the main source. It's Wahy, it's revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It came exactly how it was revealed to the Prophet وسلم, without any change. This is the pillar, this is the foundation of knowledge. The Sunnah, the authentic Sunnah, as recorded by the Imams of Hadith, is the explanation of the Quran, is another source, but it's also an extension of the Quran. These are the two sources of knowledge. Our goal, our primary source of knowledge has to be Quran and Sunnah. You may have heard this slogan, Quran and Sunnah. I'm not talking about that slogan of ditch everything, all the Imams and the Madahibs and everything, let's go back to Quran and Sunnah. I'm not talking about that slogan. What I'm trying to say here is when we learn Islam, we should learn from people who have access, who continuously refer back to Quran, back to the Sunnah. If you learn Islam from a group, an ideological group, or a group was set up to do X, Y, and Z, there are many groups in Islam. Some groups were set up 80 years ago because of a certain specific circumstance in that country. Other groups were set up for something very specific, like maybe just do, to do da'wah among certain villages. There's a group set up by the founder just to do da'wah amongst the village people. There's other groups that were set up just for political, to revive political thinking, etc., etc. And you look at any of the groups, this is how they were set up, with certain goals in mind. When they teach Islam, they will normally focus more on those aspects. When they come to the Qur'an, if my goal is only da'wah, I want nothing to do with politics, I don't want no trouble with the government, I don't want to engage with anything controversial, it's just purely da'wah. I'm only gonna, when I come to the Qur'an, I'm only going to focus on those verses to do with da'wah. If my goal is just to establish political Islam, or, or not, let's not call it political Islam, if my goal is to establish just an Islamic state, that's all, that's all I care about, then I'm going to look at the Qur'an in a certain way. When I approach the Qur'an, if I've been taught by that group, they themselves have analyzed the Qur'an and Sunnah with a particular lens, they're seeing it through their priority, their uh, ideology, their understanding of their founder. And their students will also see, approach the Qur'an in the same way. What happens then is they miss out the, the essence, the, pu the beauty, the purity, the core comprehensive message of the Qur'an. Why? Because they're put in, it's like putting on a certain colored lens. Red, you can only see red. Green, you can only see green. This is how it is. When you approach the Qur'an through a certain group or the thinking of a certain group, you will only see the Qur'an as they see the Qur'an. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to leave, come to the Qur'an, first of all, by asking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan. Meaning we've got to clear, we have to clear the path and then come directly to the Qur'an. So this is one of the uh, problems we have in our communities, that people who start becoming active, learning, often 
learn through groups. And these groups, there are positives. I'm not um, criticizing groups for the sake of it. There are positives with all groups. But when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to learning, we have to be objective. We should seek the truth. We should go to the sources. We should go to the Quran. We should go to the Sunnah. As, and I'm not saying we should disregard or throw away uh, schools of thought or legal schools or the great imams. Of course, we have to also learn from their learning and their teaching, how they understood the Quran. We don't have the capability of directly just extracting from the Quran. But even in English, even in English, go to the Quran, go to the Sunnah. And when you learn from teachers, make sure you learn from teachers who have this objectivity. They must be objective, that they are seeking the truth and not seeking to validate from the Quran just their group position or their group worldview. This is very important. So um, this was the summary of, of this verse. Inshallah, next week we'll be moving on to the last part of this story of Adam alayhi salam where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started off the dialogue with announcing that he is making a khalifa on the earth and it ends with asking the angels to bow to Adam alayhi salam and the story about when shaitan deceived Adam alayhi salam uh, and, and Hawa and they both sent down to earth. This is the ending of that section of the story inshallah. Hopefully we cover that next week.